everyone, and welcome to Esports in 30. I'm Lisa Duan, this is Matt Hempstead, and today is League of Legends Day. All of the spring splits are finally over, but we thought this would be a good time to recap regions that we don't really talk about much. So Matt, what are we looking at today? Well, we spent all of our time focusing on the West with Europe and NA, and no time at all focusing on Korea and China. So today's our chance to finally recap what's been going on over in the East. So we're going to start with the LCK. You know, SKT's been a dominant franchise in Korea, but in 2018 they kind of struggled, so we're going to see if they were finally able to get back on the throne. And then over in the LPL, Invictus Gaming are the world champions, um, but they have yet to win a domestic title, so they're looking to change that in the 2019 spring split. We're going to check all that out today. Ooh, so much to talk about. But before we get into it, let's check out these highlights from the LCK 2019 Spring Split. Everyone's saying Griffin, and people are saying Griffin going 18 and 0 is a possibility. Oh, chains coming in. On fleek. Oh, boy. The other way. The bait is coming in oh with the barrier. He misses God. it. And the follow-up with the dash. Gets the quickness of Viper right into the back line. He's going to be taken out, but Sung Yoon was the first to go down. Stopwatches are not going to be able to stop this onslaught as Lava is picked off. We're looking for the Venture Guild. That's it for Viper. Toby has a lot of sneakiness. Diving on forward and Bono didn't last uh. a couple of seconds. He's going 1v4. Lava's going to be the first one to go down. Flashes out the way. There it is, crashing down, and Toby wants to find a fantastic taunt, and that's the 100 KDA, but will he go down right afterwards? The answer is most likely no, Viper, he's bouncing around the fight, eventually he does fall down, but it's all for naught, a sword dives on forward, and Faker is killed. We've got Griffin in the rest, and no one, I mean no one, can match the pace that Griffin is setting in LCK Spring 2019. They are known as the Dream Team, but remember that KT Rolster was known as the Super Team, and by the end we saw that only right at the end could they find any success. It was more an ironic nickname than a serious one. Hoping begins again, but they're trying to stop him here. They want to get somebody ready. Finally, can't get the top 10. The ult comes in, but a stopwatch. And look at Teddy. Yeah, she's not going to be able to. It's going to come down to the spike. Look at the damage going the way what? of Afrika, and it's going to go to SKT. Does it look like it's going to be on time? Can Flip get the miracle steal? What? He's going to get it against Red. How does he do it? And how does Aiming not get the Baron? Fighting never ends in this game. It's only game one, but it's gonna go the way of Morris! What in the world as Teddy with the arrow steals it from downtown? They're going in. They want to get the kill, but that taunt was so good from the side of Ana. He's gonna steal him. No. And now Clint's gonna be able to get the kill in the back line. Rascal doesn't exist anymore. They Make weren't patient two. enough. The Maelstrom doesn't even really happen. SKT looks like they're going to be going to the finals with the clean sweep of King Zone here. They will be facing off against Griffin in the finals at Jump Seal. Teleport from Griffin as Chovy's finally found the back line. But you can see it's Griffin trying to hold this one off. Khan oh. goes golden, gets the ultimate off, and SKT, they found the team fight they wanted. And it's going to get locked down, but the heroic entrance comes in, the bouncy castle is erected, and Faker locks down the kill on his opposite number, makes that a double. All of the buttons have been pressed, Sword going down to the world end, and the AoE's finally getting in there. Lahan's not doing enough damage, and Khan says the last fight was an illusion. This is a double kill, make it a triple, as Toby tries to get out, and just finds the backhand. SKT, 3-0. Over Griffin after their incredible first round Robin. Once again, SK Telecom are the champions of the LCK. It's their seventh LCK title, and they're on their way to MSI to face off with the best from around the world. Matt, 
SKT they didn't have the best 2018, really did not. but they've managed to come back. So what do you think about this team now? I mean, going into 2019, everyone knew they had to upgrade this roster, right? And they absolutely did that. I mean, all the moves they made, they brought in Khan, they brought in Clid, Teddy, and Mata. All these guys who, you know, some of them are veterans, like Mata, obviously a huge shot caller who came over. But they also had some some younger guys and some more unproven guys, like Teddy, who came from Gen Air. And it just, it all worked around Faker as the centerpiece. Of course, whenever you have a team with Faker on it, he's always going to be the guy that kind of everything revolves around, right? But you finally bring in these other names who can draw some attention from the enemy junglers. And, you know, you can't just be like, let's just focus on Faker and we'll win the game. All of a sudden, SKT has these, these multiple folds to them. And now they're just a, a more complex team. And it seems like they finally have the things together. It didn't start out perfectly, but as they kept rolling and got that synergy going, they kind of look like the SKT of old. Yeah, well, SKT have often been dominant in their region, but the yes. question now is wondering, how will they do internationally? So how do you think they will stack up against international teams? Well, the interesting thing is, after their finals against Griffin, a lot of people were saying that their 3-0 win over Griffin was more based on Griffin's flaws rather than SKT's finesse and, and how well they played. So it's hard to judge their strength, especially now when people are saying the LCK might be the weakest it's ever been. Which is just weird to say too, but again, they've lost a lot of talent and right now they just have a lot of rosters that are kind of in in flux, right? Because mm -hmm. 2019, a lot of new teams, a lot of new rosters, and it takes time for them to, to get back into normal form. So if you're SKT, it's just hard to judge, but you know, any team that has Faker on it, you're <laughs> automatically going to be like, you know what, this team's a threat. Uh, for me, they're probably un uh, number two right now, under Invictus and above G2, but I would not be shocked to see G2, you know, go pretty even against SKT just because of how dominant they looked in their playoffs as com compared to SKT, who, you know, might have won their series more on, on Griffin's shortcomings. Right, right. We have to talk about Griffin because I think a lot of people were actually disappointed yeah. that Griffin didn't win because they looked like they were going to win. They were so close. So do you think it's just like the pressure or maybe the expectations that crashed down on them and led to their loss? I mean, their expectations were massive, right? Because they had expectations of going 18-0, which is the perfect split. It's never happened before in the LCK. And as soon as people start spewing those things of perfection, all of a sudden, that's, that you have to live up to it, right? You can't drop anything. And for a while, they didn't lose a single game in the LCK, I think like four weeks in. And then in the tournament leading up to the LCK spring split at the Kespa Cup, they went 8-0 and won in convincing fashion. Yeah. So I, I do think the expectations got to them. And if you're a sports fan, it's kind of like the Tampa Bay Lightning situation where they were the number one team in the regular season and they got clean swept, right? That's basically what happened here. They were the number one team down the stretch. They kind of found some weaknesses and then they got clean swept by SKT. Yeah. So it's just, once you have those expectations, it's tough to live up. Up to and of course there's more going on with Griffin than what just uh, me see I they obviously didn't just suddenly flatline right yeah but still it's, it's hard to live up to those those perfect images that people yeah. will behold especially for a team of rookies right it's hard to have that yeah. kind of stability that veterans often are known exactly. for um, so in that series specifically against SKT what did you think went wrong for them it, it's kind of weird because, I mean, Griffin was being Griffin for the most part. They were picking some weird things. Their bot lane has always been very creative and their drafts have been kind of bizarre. Um, but they were running things like Talia Pantheon. They ran in game one. It didn't work because, you know, they, they have to go ahead with that kind of lane, right? It's all about being aggressive in that 2v2 and trying to get an early lead. It didn't work. And then game two, they switched it up to something more standard. Uh, that didn't work, so they, you know what, let's run it back. Let's just run back game one, and it was the same thing. They just couldn't find those early edges against SKT, and once you fail in the early game, and Faker's on Rise, and today's on Ezreal, then guess what's gonna happen? It's just gonna be a pretty clean series for SKT, and it just kind of came down to Griffin being unable to execute things. So unfortunate, but uh, yeah. it was just the end of Griffin's season, and we'll see if they can come back stronger. Yeah, do you think, what do you think they need to fix for next season then, if you had to pick one thing, mainly? Well, it seems like they're kind of stuck in their ways a little bit. Mm. Uh, they, they love to be creative, and they, they don't normally default back to standard, and sometimes you just need to realize what's good in the meta, right? You know, Talia Pantheon is not the best thing in this current meta. It's just not. Uh, but they're trying to catch teams off guard and they're trying to be like, SKT, you're probably not prepared for this. So, you know, just read the patch a little better. Maybe get these players focused on the champions that are better in the meta and then see if that can translate. All right. Well, unfortunately for Griffin, SKT is the team heading into MSI as the LCK's representative. As for the LPL, well, and well, the ending actually to their playoff series was crazy. So before we call in our friend Razzleplasm, let's check out the highlights from the 2019 LPL spring season. Oh my goodness, the shot. I go right back. Yes, Grimson oh Rush to win, picks up the 8 carry. Magic, he's gonna kill there's nothing all. wrong with him. 
Ning is getting dropped down though with LWX3 firing again. Juggler down, Cataclysm on two. The Petrified guys was used to no success. LWX ults into the back line, wants to challenge the world champions face first. And for FPX, TMA dropped down, but LWX is all you need. Yeah, Bell yeah. out, the last member, as Doobie helped him. Turret number one, turret number two, FPX. The challenge against the world champions was taken. Open arms, they say, undefeated in the LPL. Look at Doobie. And Doobie is cheering for good reason. He's on top of the world. So yes, maybe. JDG, oh. there's a slight thing. Maelstrom! Oh my lord! You insane animal, Kim Goon. Falls can't help to save himself. The fight's already over. Kids oh. instantly gonna follow up. Floor spots him oh. out. They Am find Cockle. Down? How do they get the pick on the Cockle? Then the grass there as well. The Tempest Bait in the back line. The flash up from Rexai. FPX getting dismantled in this fight. And JDG, the miracle continues. It's Zoom. Barrel's at the ready. Jack Sparrow is back oh in. Oh my god. It's two. Zoom will get launched on. Matias dead. JDG. This is the fight. Goodbye, support. Hello, Zoom. The Dumpling Brothers unite. And in game five, the miracle run for JDG sends them to the grand final. The Forge got onto one, the Paranoia in onto the rise, the Shy half elf has fallen to the GA, but might be pop, they flush on in, it's Balan again, Nick comes in with the flank, it has the killer instinct, but Rookie is so good with geometry, you'd think he'd be playing Velkos as the triple goes over to the AD carry. I just said they can't fight, oh but they're God, fighting Rookie it out. Oh my God, over the wall, Jackie Love holds in, that's another kill for IG, they've already lost Lumau in the Fiddlesticks without his ultimate, and now Rookie finds Zoom, this is going from bad. At the worst, and your cow even has to flush out of the shock bus. And Rookie follows up, and oh, it no. is still not out. No summoners. Oh, adoration, oh, adoration, oh, adoration. Oh, and Invictus Gaming, it is so well deserved. Their golden run this year starts. Their opportunity to continue their streak. First, they won the 2018 World Championships, and now they've won their first domestic title. Invictus Gaming are massive threats heading into MSI. To break down the LPL Spring Split and preview MSI, we've got LPL caster Razzleplasm joining us. What's up, Raz? Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Of course. Uh, we have to talk about Invictus Gaming because they just picked up their first LPL title. How important is it for this organization now that they've finally finished first in China? It's incredible. Uh, for an organization like IG, they were legitimately one of the oldest organizations in China since 2011 when they first formed up. So for them to come so long and then not to have that domestic championship, in fact, getting the world title before it, they end up getting that domestic title, it's insane. So really well deserved from the organization. Yeah, it's definitely been a long journey for them, but in the playoffs, it was anything but. I mean, they made quick work of top sports 3-1, to one, and then in the finals, a uh, clean sweep of JD Gaming. So what makes this team so tough to beat, especially dating back to Worlds 2018 and then to now, where they finally won their first domestic title? Yeah, I love the fact that you said the World 2018 run because they didn't change anything. Uh, the, <laughs> the team literally just came to the playbook of just uh, laning phase, lane kingdom, uh, you know, top lane the shy, Rookie, they're the best in their craft and their roles in the world. So the fact that they're able to play through those lanes so consistently. And on top of that, the only weakness that team had was Jackie Love being the rookie that he was last year. And when he went up against the spotlight like Uzi or whatever in major instances, he would tend to crumple like in 2018. But now the guy looks like a veteran on the field. So it looks it, it's really tough to see this team really crumbling in an individual mechanical basis. They are on top just based off that. There's so, so much talent on that team okay, and just yeah. China in general. So we want to talk about another team, JD Gaming, because they were they had an exceptional story, right? They had the miracle run in the works before they were halted by Invictus. But so but how did JD almost get the whole like run? You know, like how did they almost win? Yeah, it kind of feels like that Mike, uh, that Mighty Ducks moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I didn't see it, too. I remember going into the regular season. This team lost a lot in the preseason. Uh, they lost Loken to TOP. They lost Clit to SKT. And so for them, it was more of a rebuilding period. They didn't expect themselves to be in the playoffs, let alone, like, in the finals. Uh, the LPL was super competitive. But for JD to get into the finals, uh, the playoffs, that is, in a eighth place position, we've never had an eighth place team go into the finals in the LPL history. Uh, a lot of it, I would give a credit to Coach Ohm. Coach Ohm is really like, 
in Tabe's word, like a godlike coach. He, he's been around the block. He's led Team WE to the semifinals at Worlds. And it seems like the drafting for this squad when they got into uh, semis was on point. And then I give a lot of credit, actually, to Imp and Lumao because this team has one demon and it's the bottom side of the map. In the regular season, they would completely be flatlined. Uh, but when they went up against Mystic and Team WE in the first round, they actually solo killed them and was winning through their bottom lane. Same thing happened in the second series when they went against Uzi. So it's such a, it feels like a coin flip. I didn't expect it to happen where Imp came back uh, when it really mattered to find themselves in the finals. Was it just one of those situations where, I mean, in the regular season, you're trying to figure things out with your new roster, and then all of a sudden, in playoffs, things just kind of start to click? Or was it actually, you know, them finding things out and getting better through the draft uh, during, you know, that whole transition period? I really think it was a mix of both. Because during the first four weeks, you even saw it on Weibo, the players coming out and defending the new members of Flawless, uh, uh, Levi even, of saying that it really was just about synergy. Because a lot of these players, remember, like, they don't speak... Uh, the Chinese language right. and for Clid, when he was initially on the team he faced those trials they had a communication system set up for him so they got to that point they lost them and so they really had to be able to now incorporate a new member with a separate language roster so like that was insane for them to be able to build up from that uh, and then on top of that stylistically I think it was a good fit for Flawless coming into the team because he really had that same uh, raw early game energy that Clit had, especially the Lee Sim play. I, I love that one. <laughs> the biggest hardship, I would say, was that Loken in the bottom lane was an upcoming star. Like, that's how good he was. And so bringing in Imp, it really felt like they were trying to cover up for the fact that they were really losing out in a lot of uh, skill in the bottom side of the map. And it was on Imp a lot of onus there for him to really... You know, build himself up, get to a point where his 2v2s were actually being a strength rather than a weakness, and it really came up in that moment. So it really did feel like Imp's um, experience came up in that moment, where he was a former LPL champion, you know, he is a world champion, that when he came under the spotlight, he didn't crumble. That's amazing. Now, the biggest upset by JD Gaming was over Fun Plus Phoenix, who finished first in the regular season. But before we talk about the specific loss, can you give us some context to, like, where did Phoenix come from and how did this team evolve so drastically in the offseason? My God. Like, that, for <laughs> me, in the, in the preseason, I had them ranked as a seventh place team. Like, that is literally how much of a surprise it was wow. in the regular season. And we saw this team find themselves at first place. And I've talked to the you know, the Chinese casters, some of the coaches out there, and a lot of people say one word, and that's doing B. Mm -hmm. Doing B for the team, even though it was legitimately two members coming into the roster, both doing B and Tian, he is feeling so much in terms of leadership, uh, a major upgrade in mechanics between him and Cool. Um, and he has that attitude, out of game and in game, of yeah. being able to, even in real, like, real times of hardship, to be able to boost people's uh, morale. So he does so much, including, you know, just as a small bit, so people remember, like, notice this, that usually, like, timing flashes, cooldowns, all that stuff, like, across the map, that's usually what the support's role is. But Doombi just takes that, owns it. He takes as much responsibility and then just goes out in the field and he performs. So uh, there's a reason why he came into the playoffs as an MVP because uh, he really performed as like one. And also his pop-offs after the games are just stellar. You can really see how much this guy cares about the game. I mean, he's one of few players who actually show emotion after a big win or whatever. Most of them yeah. are pretty calm and collected, but yes. not doing B. Uh, obviously, Please. this split ended That's with good. a disappointment, <laughs> but do you think this team has what it takes to bounce back in summer and repeat their regular season results? Because no one thought they'd be in first in spring. Do you think they can do it again in summer, but actually you know, do well in playoffs this time? A thousand percent. I think so. Because it this is where like the specifics do matter because the fashion in which they lost to JD, I thought they would actually move on to the finals. In game four, they shouldn't have won that. They had all the advantages in the back pocket, but it's just some of those crucial mistakes that they'll look back on, reflect, and start to clean up. Because when they have leads, a lot of the time they ramp it up and take more risks when a lot of the natural inclinations for you know shot callers is to actually slow the game down. And I think that's something that they'll recognize and go forward with. Because also on top of that, I forget, uh, they have Warhorse, their new coach as well, who is the coach of Flash Wolves last year. So like the injection of like stronger strategy, their graphs have been great. Uh, stronger leadership as well from both fronts as the coach and uh, mid laner. They have a lot that's primed for what's going to be a strong summer split. 
Oh, exciting. So yeah. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here, talking about bit. summer split. True. But, but <laughs> we'll have to see on that one. Uh, when we're talking about the LPL, we have to mention Uzi and RNG, of course, because they, they're always at the forefront, right, at international events and even the LPL. But they weren't really that huge this year in playoffs. So why has this team taken kind of a step back uh, in 2019? Their big, um, you know, what, the big addition that this team made was actually Amazing J in the top lane. So in the preseason, there were a few announcements that they made that MLXG would be taking a break, Let Me would be taking a break, and Zatai was retiring. Mm. And so when Amazing J came in from BLG, I was personally excited for that because Amazing J had had that whole guise of, you know, he's a leader as well in his previous teams, and he was the person who was like their primary option, like primary engage, primary tank, primary damage. He came into this team with a pretty strong pedigree in my estimation, but the biggest issue is like when the regular season happened, he was actually the one who took too many risks, fell flat a lot of the times when he had the ability to carry in these games. So uh, this team recognized that. They brought Zatai back from retirement. From the dead. <laughs> yes, it really, I know, right? I was like, wait a second, this happened? Um, but you know, for him to come back, it was pretty much too little too late. That's like week eight when that ended up happening. Uh, so going into the playoffs, they just had a hole in the top side of the map and really some demons once again of going back to playing too heavily around Uzi. And so Xiaohu was a primary strength in the early on in the season. They just didn't play through him at all this playoffs. So I think they have a whole lot to work on going into the summer split. I had a discussion with one of the Chinese casters and, if I, and when we had the discussion about like who would go to Worlds in the future, for me, RNG wasn't even on the list. So it really wow. goes to the whole idea of how competitive the LPL is and how much L RNG has to work on to really get a top laner back. If Lemmy comes back, and that's wonderful. If Zatai has more time on the field, I think he's going to do it for them. But there's a lot to work with. Yeah, it definitely seemed like one of the more competitive splits in the LPL, which yeah. is pretty crazy to see. I'm actually curious, yeah. Raz. So like, obviously, the LPL is full of talent. There's personalities there. Is there something you feel like the region lacks, though? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, with so many new players coming into the forefront, I think uh, ultimately discipline and slower uh, strategical play is something that I'm not really seeing here. So I would give a good example of a team that's doing it very well is BLG because they have Kuro coming into the team and they're a team that can slow the pace of the game down and really make it about like, uh, you know, uh, play through the map rather than playing through team fights. But then they're, on they're the really on the only ones doing that where if you look through all of these teams, you're like, that's a hectic team fighting team. That's another hectic team fighting team. Uh, that's a team that has a good coach and good drafting, but in the end of the day, hectic team fighting team. <laughs> so so uh, I think uh, strategic um, flexibility amongst the 16 teams in the LPL is something that I'm a little bit worried about now going for, if IG has to go against SKT and MSI and a team that has so much control on the map, that might be a big challenge for them. No, that's perfect. You just made the segue for us, basically, Raz. Because we were just going to jump into MSI a little bit. Uh, let's go to Invictus Gaming, as you just said. How do you think they stack up against teams like SKT, G2, and yeah. I guess Team Liquid if they actually qualify? I mean, they still have to do that technically. That's true. Yeah, they have to get into the main stage first, which is going to be fun. Uh, I think IG still, for me, comes out as favorites simply because while there are questions to the tr strategical elements of the team, uh, they were never really the strongest team fighting team, but they had to build themselves up ever since like taking on RNG, JDG, FPX through team fights. They got to a, a pretty strong degree of being able to do that. But to answer your question, uh, I think SKT is their biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Not only in the fact that they are they have such a strong draft, they have such great control of the map. Clit is always pathing to the right parts and they have like really good control words placements. Uh, but once again, zeroing in on Clid, Clid was a former JDG uh, jungler, and what he brought to SKT was uh, fierceness, ability to, you know, headstrong, engage when he feels like the play needs to be made, and that was the primary weakness for a lot of the LCK teams going in the world, is that they were a control team that didn't really have a fang to them. They didn't really have that member who could start fights, so when team fighting was a major I issue, no one really came over that hump. Uh, I think SKT is a really strong answer. Uh, control wards have always been my criticism to Invictus Gaming. During the regular season, they were one of the worst teams at being able to place control wards. In their last two series, they got really improved on that. So I think if they remain consistent on that, then they should be fine. Okay.
Okay, okay. Um, let's take a brief look at Group A, actually, because the play-in stage is coming up first. Um, group A has Fenerbahce, if I hope I said that right, Feng Vu Buffalo, yeah. Bombers, and Isaris Gaming. Um, just briefly, Raz, which teams should we keep an eye on, and who do you think is going to win this group? <laughs> that is, look, for anyone that, like, looked at the play-in uh, group draw, <laughs> I am, like, I am so sad. Because yeah. for Why? context's sake, Feng Vu Buffalo... Fenerbahce and Isaris were all of the favorites coming into this uh. tournament. So, like, if the discussion was, like, who's going to get out of groups, we're like, well, hopefully Fangfu Buffalo and 1907 Fenerbahce are on different groups. But then literally at the beginning of the draw, they both got slotted into the same group. And I was like, oh, let's just hope that Isaris <laughs> is not in the... Oh, they are. <laughs> so, like... I think that if I'm putting them all in the pair, I feel very bad, first of all, for Bombers. I think Bombers come at the end of it because mm -hmm. they got the worst draw of it. But I think uh, 1907 Fenerbahce comes out. I, I watched the team going through the uh, TCL and I felt like Kire, who is you know, my former jungler when I was coaching uh, Dignitas earlier on, I think he performed excellently in the TCL. He was the MVP of the split as well. And then Ruin in the top laner, has just been consistently like 1v5ing in a lot of cases when he's been playing split push carries like Jace and uh, Nico. So they have a very strong core and they have a great identity where Bolulu and their bottom lane actually plays really well towards top side. So uh, they're a team that's very disciplined, very standard. So if you guys are, you know, hoping for like that nice cheese that we got from <laughs> yep. uh, teams in the uh, past, I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting just like disciplined, gentlemanly play. Uh, and I think that they should be able to take it over Feng Vu. All right, well, if all the favorites are in Group A, then Group B is probably not as exciting. But we're going to have to talk about it <laughs> briefly anyways. They've got Detonation yeah. Nation, uh, Focus Me, INTZ Esports, Mega, and Vega. So who do you think is going to escape out of this group? So here's the joke about this one, because even I don't know. Like, I have a, a gut feeling on this one, but a lot of these teams that are now in Group B, there is no front runner, and a lot of them have, like, places where they have to learn. And I think for me... Uh, INTZ is a team where I expect them to take it just because they have that element of like a good map control and on top of that they've been carrying through their mid and jungle so Envy has been a really strong point for uh, INTZ so I would say that the CB LOL team advances and I would hopefully they can have that good shot versus the LMS squad. Mm, exciting. All right, well, Raz, we're out of time uh, with you, but thank you so much for joining us, and we can't wait to see you on the main stage. This is your first main stage, right? Yes. Congrats. I, I, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for the, you know putting in a lot of work. I'm glad to be in a, you know being able to follow Invictus Gaming on this run. So hopefully, I don't, you know. <laughs> Spoil it for them. Hopefully they can continue to succeed. If I come on my first event and they bomb out at the beginning, I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm in play on planes from now on. <laughs> That's it. All right, all right. Well, well. Hopefully you're not their jinx, but I'm sure I'm sure you're not. But thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Have a nice one. All right, Matt. Now we usually wrap it up with the player of the week, but I think it's better this time if we do a player of the split. So for the LPL, who would be your pick? I'm going to piggyback off Raz a little bit here and go with the Shy. I mean, you saw how dominant he was in the playoffs against JD Gaming. They clean swept, and he was the playoff MVP. So obviously his, his uh, effect in the game was definitely felt. And if you're a team that relies on 1v1s and winning lane into winning game, then the top lane is where it all starts. Because if you have that top lane pressure and you have that teleport advantage, it just opens up everything for your team. So I think he's absolutely crucial to what Invictus tries to do in their game plan. And it seems like every week this guy has a, uh, a Twitch clip that's just, you know, on the top of the LPL. Twitch page. So he's a mechanical god, and I just can't wait to see what he does at MSI against some of the world's best. That's right, and I think he's just getting started because he'll be showing off at MSI as well as Invictus Gaming as they challenge the likes of G2 and SKT. It's going to be incredibly hype, so you guys don't want to miss any of the action starting on May 1st. Now tomorrow on Esports in 30, AJ and Ron will be taking over the couch and talking Overwatch League. So until then, you can hit us up on our socials at Squad State, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye!